David, for me, I think these inscriptions are really exciting. Uh, the, the whole concept that the alphabet uh, came out of these, uh, I mean, that there's proof that there was, this is where it began. Uh, there's something pretty exciting here. It's exciting for me because I've personally been there to see them. And that was one of the reasons I went to Sinai in the first place with my expeditions was to go and locate these inscriptions. They're called Proto-Sinaitic. All that simply means is that they're the earliest form of writing that we find in Sinai, and that's where they were first found, which is why it's got the label. Uh, other people would call them early alphabetic scripts. Uh, but what was amazing was the fact that they evolve, it would appear, out of Egyptian hieroglyphs. So some clever person, a Semite, has taken the Egyptian hieroglyphs and he said, okay, this, this shape is the shape of a house. Okay, now Egyptian, that word would be pear for house. But in, in Hebrew or in Northwest Semitic languages, the word is bait, okay? So this shape, this hieroglyphic shape becomes the letter B for bait. Okay, now, and that's what they did. That's how our alphabet arrives at from these early signs. You can do it with every one of those signs can convert in our modern alphabet. So somebody with an understanding of Egyptian hieroglyphs who was a, a Semite, right? Yeah. Uh, at a particular time in history, uh, grabbed onto these symbols yeah. and used them and, and made them something different. Made them something very special, an alphabet, because ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs are not an alphabet. Ancient cuneiform is not an alphabet. None of them are, they're syllabic uh, scripts, okay? So here we have, for the first time, the use of 26, 27, some 20, some people say 22 signs that are consonants, that they can combine to make words. And that's the real skill of it here. There are no vowels written at this time. It's still only consonants. But you can make so many combinations of words from these few letters. And we have 26 letters in the alphabet right now, so n not very much has changed for almost, what, 4,000 years? All they've added is the, is the, is the vowels. Yeah, or actually, it's probably, what would it be? It would be actually more than, would it be about 4,000 years, wouldn't it, have been it, when uh, this alphabet would just, it's, was... It's three and a half thousand, well, yes, no, you're quite right, actually. It would be between three and a half thousand and, say, 4,000 years ago. That this alphabet came about. Yeah. And it's been, so you can just move letters around and create words. Yeah, absolutely. So people have been critical of even the existence of Moses, and they're saying that Moses couldn't even have written any, any of this, and that the Bible, the early parts of the Bible were written a thousand years after the event of the Exodus. And uh, why I find this interesting with the alphabet is this Semitic Northwestern, what, do you, what would you call it, a Northwest Semitic? Northwest Semitic is the safe way to describe it because we quite, it quite clearly is Northwest Semitic. Whether we can say it's Hebrew is not a matter of looking at the language and the script, that's a matter of when, when it all happened. It's a matter of history, in other words. So if we have Moses placed in this period of the Middle Bronze Age, the time of the 12th and 13th dynasty in Egypt, if Moses was alive then, then you can say it's Hebrew. If you want to put Moses in the time of Ramesses II, then it can't be Hebrew, because it's too early to be Hebrew. And that's the crunch of the whole thing. No, I didn't think, I, I don't think I followed with you with that. Why couldn't it be Hebrew if it's in the time of Ramesses? Because if you're saying basically that Moses and Joseph were actually later in time than when this script was invented for the first time, then somebody other than Hebrews or Israelites must have invented it. Mm -hmm. It couldn't have been them. Mm -hmm. Okay, I get it now. So, uh, th I mean, that's why, and, and one of the reasons why people won't call it Hebrew, even though it's an early form of Hebrew, is because Moses and, and these people couldn't have existed because it wasn't until five or 600 BC that the story was uh, created. That's a different issue. That's, that's the argument that uh, the biblical stories were written down at the time of Josiah, King Josiah, or perhaps Jeremiah might have been the author. Some people have suggested that. I would prefer to see it that they were compilers of the Bible. In other words, these texts were already written, uh, but they brought them together to create what we call the Tanakh, the, the entire Old Testament. 
And so that's the action that might have been going on in the 7th century BC. Not the actual writing of them, but the, but the compiling of them. And maybe some editing was going on as well. We talked about that example of, of Ramesses being the name given to the city that the Israelites lived in. Well, we think it's probably Avarish that they lived in, and that name has been changed at the time of Josiah for the audience of Josiah's day. At that time, they would have known about Ramesses, but they would never would have known about Avaris. So if this Northwest Semitic script was available, mm. and you're looking at the Middle Kingdom as being a time when the Exodus could have happened, sure. do you think that Moses could have then written the first five books? The clue to this, is not just simply identifying it as Biblical Hebrew, but actually reading it. Once you know what the contents were of these inscriptions, once you can read them and actually make out what's being said here, and when you find things like the word manna being said, the word manna occurs in this script, that's part of the Biblical story. Let's talk about that, that inscription. So you took these inscriptions, you've been to that location, mm -hmm. and uh, you took these inscriptions and, and contacted a rabbi in Jerusalem. Yeah, that was a very interesting experiment. I thought, well, you know, I'm not a Semiticist. I'm not the sort of person who could actually de delve deeply into this. I can identify the signs into Hebrew letters. I know which signs represent which Hebrew letters. So what I did was I copied down all these inscriptions into Hebrew letters and sent them to the rabbi. Okay, now I'd never met him. We'd done all this by the internet. And I just simply said to him, look, I'm sending you some sentences in Hebrew. Can you make anything of them? Can you read them? Are they gobbledygook? What do you make of this? Do we read them left to right, right to left? Who knows? I'm leaving it up to you to decide what you think this is. And within 24 hours, he sent me an email back and he said, this is biblical Hebrew. I can read it as if I was reading a Torah scroll. It's biblical Hebrew. It makes absolute sense to me. I'm a rabbinical scholar. I know my Torah and I can read this straight off the page. Well, what, what, did, what were some of the things that were written there? Well, there are things like instructions how to use manna. Not to, you know that in the Bible, there's a big thing about, you know, you mustn't store it. You have to eat it when it's, when it's given to you. And, and, and this thing says, pay attention to, to the way you use manna. You know, follow the Father and his instructions. It also says things like, I uprooted, I uprooted a beautiful garden. Now, what does that mean? It means that the slaves, the Israelite slaves, have been uprooted from the garden, which is a reference to Egypt. We hear about Egypt being called the garden. They've been uprooted from there, and they've left it and come into Sinai. All these things relate to the biblical story of Exodus, and they're there on the rock walls. And this is what Flinders Petrie found in Hilda? Yeah. What I understand is that uh, it, it was a while for them to interpret it. Why couldn't they see the connection between Hebrew today and this ancient language? It was a difficult one, really, I suppose. They weren't uh, themselves familiar with the Semitic languages and script. They e were Egyptologists, of course. They had to have a specialist to come along who really got to grips with it, and that was Sir Alan Gardiner. And he was a, a great scholar of different languages and scripts. And he managed to translate one simple uh, phrase, if you like, into Northwest Semitic. And that was the point at which we all decided that Northwest Semitic was what this was rep represented here in these inscriptions. But even then, it's taken us forever to actually translate them because nobody's been trying to read them as Biblical Hebrew. They've been struggling to try them, to, uh, try them in a different way. So I go and I send this stuff to the rabbinical scholar in Israel, Rabbi Mikael, and he just comes back and says, well, I can read it straight off the page. And what type of a, uh, I mean, he has a Yemenite background. Would, would, would he have a, seen uh, the text? Like, did Hebrew uh, text change over time or? It's more the fact that the Yemenite uh, tradition is more conservative. It's been maintained over the centuries. It's not as a modern Hebrew, if you like. It's much more ancient. The traditions are more ancient. And, and therefore, you get closer to the original language of the Bible by studying through the Yemenite school. I know you've suggested that the people haven't been able to find evidence for the characters in the Bible because they're looking in the wrong time. Do you think that there's any connection to this not seeing evidence earlier with this whole connection to the Northwest Semitic language? 
in a sense, when you propose a new idea, a theory, if you like, you, you put it down, you present it to your peers and you present it to the public. And then it's tested. And the way it's tested is you try and find the evidence to confirm whether the theory is right or to knock the theory down. This discovery was made many years ago of these, these inscriptions in Sinai, but I didn't start looking at them until after I'd written the theory of the new chronology. So for me, this is new evidence that proves that Moses did exist at the right time period that I would place Moses, and he's writing a Hebrew script that would enable him to write the laws of Moses and the itinerary of the Exodus and even possibly the book of Genesis itself. Now that to me is a proof for the new chronology. It shows that this is the real time period of the Exodus. This is the real time period of the wanderings and this is the real time period of the conquest. You said the book of Genesis. Did you mean book of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers and Deuteronomy? No. I meant that he'd written the itinerary, etc., etc., and he may even have written the book of Genesis. Okay. Because, in fact, that's the one book that everybody says he could not have written. Hmm. Yeah, the impossible one. Yeah, because there's just no way you could write something as long as that and complex as that. You might be able to write numbers and Deuteronomy because the laws. And that, that's the sort of thing you, you could expect a leader to be writing laws. Who do you think actually was the inspiration for this, this alphabet? I think it has to be Joseph. That would be my guess because of what he was. He was the vizier of Egypt. He was the most important man in Egypt after the Pharaoh. He was educated. He worked in the palace. He was running the country virtually. He was an administrator. Now he was familiar with Egyptian hieroglyphs. So what better person to invent the Hebrew alphabet than the person who was familiar with the hieroglyphs, who knew the Semitic people, who was administering the land, he's the guy who's most likely to be able to come up with this idea. Well, I know that some people, there, there must have been a lot of people who've looked at this, this language earlier, and, 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 or this text, this script, right? There must have been a number of people who looked at it. Do scripts have to sort of grow over time and they change their shapes and their forms? Didn't Hebrew actually a change over time, early forms of Hebrew was, were different than the Hebrew we have today? Yeah, if you look at modern Hebrew, even if you look at biblical Hebrew from the 9th century or the time of Josiah, the 7th century, it's very different to these proto sinaitic in inscriptions that we find. The letters look rather different. But you can see how they evolve from it. And time is the thing that makes these things change. And so if we think about this first alphabet, it's Northwest Semitic. People just didn't know who to assign it to, right? They just couldn't figure that out in the beginning. They just thought it was Northwest Semitic. They couldn't say any more than that. But the fact is that we've inherited the entire alphabet from these people, from whoever it was, whether it was Joseph or somebody else. People such as Professor Rolston say that it can't be Hebrew because the Hebrew writing didn't exist until much later in time. That's true. He calls this language Northwest Semitic. These inscriptions are Northwest Semitic. But I say it's a matter of history, not a matter of language. You can interpret them as Hebrew only if you have the history to back it up. So it's all about history, not so much about language. I'm an old romantic. When I see something like this in the desert, I have to believe that Joseph was the inventor of this script. I have to believe that Moses used this script to write the laws. I have to believe that Moses was the guy who actually physically carved these inscriptions on the rocks. And so for me, this is very, very fulfilling that we have things that make the Bible come to life, inscriptions that make the Bible come to life for the very first time. And this era, which is always supposed to be mythology, not real, not real history. And here we have texts carved on the wall that could be the work of Moses, the words of Moses in the Sinai Peninsula. And that is terrifically exciting. <laughs>